Well, good morning, everybody. For those of you here on the West Coast with us in Los Angeles, and good afternoon and good evening to people uh, elsewhere. Uh, particularly, I've noticed that people have logged on from Brazil and from India, and we surely welcome you. Um, this is an educational seminar um, supported by the Masket Foundation. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge my uh, co-hosts today, Nicole Fram, uh, Rick Silver, Dan Crevoy, and Stephen Nades. We'll be sharing um, our cases. My slides are not advancing. There we go. Uh, we'll be sharing cases from the foundation, and we'll talk a little bit more about them as we go on. Uh, before we start, though, uh, just a little bit of homework here. Uh, first of all, I'm very, very uh, indebted to the Research Study Club uh, and the LA County Optometric Societies uh, who have enabled us to give you uh, continuing education, continuing medical education this morning. Uh, in order to get that uh, educational credit, uh, you will receive a, um, a survey following um, the, uh, the seminar and please do uh, fill it out and return it so that we can understand uh, how we have helped or not helped you understand this, these case management issues. Um, also in keeping uh, with uh, CE credits, uh, these are our disclosures. Um, and I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about the Masket Foundation. It is the educational research and compassionate care arm uh, of uh, the advanced vision care practice. Uh, the foundation has been operating for the last four or five years. Um, and our missions are to provide care for the underserved, um, support our research, and also provide um, uh, professional education, hence the um, webinar this morning. We've also been able to support fellowships. Uh, we've had research fellowship, um, a fellow from, uh, from Hungary, uh, we've had a clinical fellow from Los Angeles, and now we have a clinical optometric fellow uh, also from Southern California. Um, with the generous contribution of our patients and support and industry from Johnson and & Johnson and, and Zeiss, uh, we've been able to uh, amass enough money to care for patients who otherwise would not be able to get this care. And we're gonna talk about some of those case situations this morning. Um, one of the conditions uh, that we have been able to help patients with is those with iris defects. Uh, the practice was one of 12 um, in the United States to participate uh, in the human optics artificial trial. Uh, unfortunately, in that trial, though, patients were not supported economically by the sponsor. And the device during the trial was expensive at $5,500. Many people couldn't afford that. And so as you'll see in a few moments, we went ahead and started raising money so we could help these individuals. I think most of us have come to understand that iris defects impact life uh, as well as vision. Uh, the lack of pupil function affects depth of focus. Uh, glare is horrific. And depending upon the color of the iris and the extent of the defect, this can have a really marked uh, degradation in quality of life. Uh, some conditions, uh, fortunately, can allow uh, for suturing, uh, as in this case of a congenital incomplete inferior iris coloboma, but uh, more extensive conditions require some other artificial device. Uh, this is the right eye, actually, of a California highway patrolman, and um, he sustained uh, an injury while actually trying to help somebody who was jumping uh, onto a freeway from a bridge. And uh, it actually became uh, quite, a, quite an issue. Um, as you can see here in this photograph, he's got a, a defect in the iris and the, the right eye. He was um, highly honored by the state of California from then uh, Attorney General Kamala Harris and Governor Jerry Brown. He received the highest medal of valor, but he could not get workers' compensation to pay uh, for, his, uh, for his iris repair. And so we used his case as a great stimulus to start raising money. 
uh, ultimately, uh, we were able uh, to get workers' comp to pay for it, but we were able to use the money then to help others. So you can see here his preoperative view, and this is what he looks like after surgery. His life was very significantly impacted. Once this occurred, he could no longer drive due to glare. He was relegated to a desk job and had a significant impact uh, on his um, income as well as on his psyche. Uh, once we were able to remove his cataract and replace uh, the missing piece of iris with an artificial iris, it restored him to a full active lifestyle and had a, again, a, just a huge uptick in his life. Uh, this is that device I mentioned, the human optics artificial iris. Um, artisans in Germany take silicone and match it to a photograph uh, or to uh, photographs of the fellow eye or to even magazine pictures. We've had a couple of patients uh, who have brought in movie stars who they wanted to look like. Cameron Diaz being the prototype. Um, and then these are very thin. They're placed uh, in a variety of places inside the eye, either suture fixated, or we prefer at the time of surgery to place it in the capsule bag at the same time if the patient needs cataract surgery. Unfortunately, many of these damaged eyes uh, no longer have a lens that we can use. And so there are a host of ways that we can fixate it uh, uh, to the eye. Um, I, I want to be very careful, though, that you don't confuse that human optics device um, with the bright ocular or new iris. These are devices that are manufactured in the U.S. but not allowed to be implanted here. Uh, these really destroy eyes. You can see this degree of bleeding inside the eye, corneal edema. These are angle fixated, and they're placed in otherwise normal eyes strictly for the purpose of changing eye color. Um, and they can induce horrific glaucoma, uh, bleeding, cataract, iris atrophy. There's almost no part of the eye that they don't harm. So these are an absolute no-no, not to be confused with the human optics iris, which uh, is implanted never in the anterior chamber. I'm gonna use the case of Santiago here as an example of uh, uh, what we can do. And this is, uh, this is what Santiago looked like in his mid 40s when he came to see me. He had a childhood injury. He had a hyphema, uh, ultimately a lot of iris loss. And you can see as a teenager he had cataract surgery, but this posterior chamber lens is actually impaled in the iris and partly in the anterior chamber. Um, there's a lot of Summering's ring retained here and marked loss of iris. So he had an ugly, painful, poor seeing eye. And because uh, of the nature of the surgery in those days, he had seven diopters of anisometropia. So at surgery, we had several goals. Uh, one of them was to remove the lens that's in the wrong place, and the other is to replace that lens and replace uh, the missing iris. This is an anterior chamber uh, trocar maintainer. Um, almost invariably, you need to replace fluid as you do the surgery. Um, unfortunately, uh, when you combine an iris and a lens, if you do it at the same time, you need a relatively large incision, which he needed to get out that old non-foldable lens. So we trefin the artificial iris to the size we want based on the white to white measurement. And then here we're gonna sew um, this lens to the iris with nino uh, proline. And then we're gonna very carefully mark on each side um, of the haptics where to place the um, Gore-Tex suture that we will use to sew the lens iris combination in the eye. Uh, underneath the sheet's glide, we've already loosened the pre-existing lens and now we're gonna take it out of the eye on top of the glide. As I mentioned, we need a large incision because that was a rigid PMMA lens. And we'll enlarge it just slightly more to enable us to implant this artificial lens and artificial iris combination. And we do it in what we call a handshake technique. We go through sclerotomies that are five millimeters apart and about two and a half to three millimeters posterior to the limbus. We make certain that we're underneath the summer rings ring and underneath the existing iris remnant and pass this Gore-Tex suture. And you have to be very careful not to twist them uh, or then you have to start all over and you create what I call as a world of hurt. And then under copious uh, OVD to protect the endothelium, um, we place this inside the eye. <clears throat> and then we use slip knots to gradually tension the sutures uh, so that we make sure that we're centered with the iris and lens. 
Uh, I don't like to leave the summer rings ring inside the eye so we can tease it out. These things are very, very tenacious and thick and they can be a real uh, chore to remove if they fall into the back of the eye. The knots then have to be buried in the sclera and then of course the incision has to be closed. And I prefer the use of fiber and adhesive to close these very large conjunctival incisions. Very often because of prior surgery, they don't hold sutures well. And he had a wonderful outcome. You can see the preoperative and postoperative results. Uh, and then here above again, preoperative and then postoperative. And this had just a, a marked uh, improvement in his quality of life. And we'll hear a little bit of what Santiago had to say. I really am a big fan of the healing arts. And before the surgery, I was already on the path to go get my yoga license. What happened after the surgery was it just opened up a new breath in my chapter. It gave me a chance to say, look, this is no longer Santiago with a brutal left eye that doesn't see well. And it gives me a sense of clarity, truly, to when I speak to people that I'm getting through to them directly. After the surgery, I made an extra effort to show up as often as I could to really be a part of the study because the study was gonna help others. And it became bigger than just me. And I'm really grateful that my surgery can be an example for every other kid, adult, child out there who's looking to have better vision. And so I, I think you recognize that um, we really made a major impact in his life with that artificial iris. And again, we needed a significant um, amount of money to help him. Today, that artificial iris costs $8,800. Uh, but again, we're able to do this due to the generous contributions. Um, I'd like now to introduce uh, two people, Dr. Stephen Nades and Dr. Rick Silver, who are going to talk to us about the next case. Uh, Steve joined our practice uh, two or three years ago, and I always refer to him when I introduce the patient that he's my future. Um, he obviously has a longer future than I. He's been a wonderful addition to advanced vision care. Um, he's going to uh, share a, a patient uh, with uh, Dr. Rick Silver. Dr. Rick Silver is um, somebody who's helped us so much with patients with difficult contact lens management. Uh, he is a, also a foundation board member. Um, and uh, I think most of the optometric community knows Rick very, very well in Los Angeles. So um, Steve, why don't you go ahead and start? Thanks, Sam. And th thanks so much for those kind words. And thanks everybody for being a part of this. Uh, I'm going to start with a case presentation uh, of a young lady with really advanced keratoconus who we were fortunate enough to be able to help out. So this is a 22-year-old female. She presented to us initially with a three-month history of blurred vision in the left eye more so than the right eye. She's had no previous history of ocular surgery. Uh, she's had no other eye problems prior to this. And she does note a history of eye rubbing for many years, as we know that is a, a significant contributor to the progression of keratoconus. Um, and most importantly, because of her visual disability, she's dropped out of school, she's been unable to drive, and she's been unable to work. So let's look at her presenting uh, imaging studies. So at the top there, that's a, uh, that's a topography um, showing what looks to be um, a bow tie pattern. And certainly, you know, with somebody who's seeing 2030 uncorrected with a significant bow tie pattern like that, um, you have to think about keratoconus because patients can see through these cones uh, and they can actually see relatively well. So you may be fooled into thinking that's, uh, that's a symmetric astigmatism, but really um, it's not. And then if you look down at the uh, pachymetry map, um, we note that her thinnest area is 466 microns. Um, and then when you see the left eye, it's a dead giveaway. Um, just so much central steepening, uh, a presenting vision of count fingers at four feet. And her pachy is quite thin, 397. So this is a patient that has really advanced keratoconus in the left eye and um, quite honestly makes us nervous for the future of her right eye as well. So we have to do something. So what's the plan for a patient like this? Well, um, she needs something done. Otherwise, her right eye is going to progress to her left eye in, in theory. And so both eyes, you could argue, need corneal cross-linking. And, and so corneal cross-linking is an FDA-approved surgical therapy that um, 
helps stop the progression of keratoconus. Um, there are there, currently the FDA approval is for the epithelium off version, while the epithelium on is going through trials. Um, so we decided that given the uh, appearance of her right eye and the potential for progression, she needed epithelium off cross-linking. Um, in order to do that procedure, you need to have a residual uh, corneal thickness of 400 microns once the epithelium is removed. And so we felt like that would be possible in the right eye, but with her left eye, uh, with, a, with a pachymetry already of 397 microns, it's likely not possible to do epithelium off cross-linking, so we may have to wait for epithelium on. Um, so we did go ahead and cross-link her right eye. Um, she's been quite stable in the right eye. Um, and so with the help, the gracious help of Dr. Silver, we were able to, uh, to fit her for lenses and actually really significantly improve her vision. Um, and actually the plan was to maximize the vision in the left eye uh, prior to cross-linking so that she could have some useful vision. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Silver. Dr. Silver, thank you so much. And um, the floor is yours. Uh, ju just before Dr. Silver starts, one of the things I neglected to mention at the outset uh, is um, for you attendees, please don't hesitate to ask questions. You notice along the bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A section. So please do write down your questions. And at the end, we'll do our very, very best to answer them. Uh, Rick, please, I'm sorry. Sure, thank you. I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Okay, hello and, uh, and thanks for joining us today. Many of you, as Sam said, know me as I practice approximately 40 years in both Santa Monica and Sherman Oaks. Um, before I start, I wanna thank Sam and Barbara for the tremendous effort they put into their foundation and the other presenters today who donate their time to support the Masket Foundation. I've been asked to discuss this case that uh, we shared and rather than a tutorial and fitting, I wanted to share some history before we lead into that case which involved uh, a true collaborative effort. I have no financial disclosures related to this. The earliest published data begins in 1827 with Herschel, an English astronomer and scientist who described a process where corneal shape determination was possible by impression molding using gelatin filled in a pre-existing glass shell. Fick and Muller followed up years later with their work all the early lenses were based on some type of a fluid reservoir filling in the lens, which were all blown glass. It is not coincidental that during this time in the late 1880s, cocaine became used clinically as a local anesthetic in ophthalmology, dentistry, and surgery. These lenses were extremely uncomfortable to wear and caused the cornea to swell in a short period of time. Reuben Greenspoon made notable contributions to the science of scleral shell fitting and in the late 1920s, he is noted to be the first doctor in California to fit scleral shells. He developed a series of impression trays that allowed much thinner lens designs, embraced lathe cut technology from Zeiss in Germany for better optics, and switched from reservoir based lenses to those with fenestration holes at the limbus that allowed transfer of oxygen and tears. He analyzed the molds of the first 250 patients and with statistically correlated data constructed the first trial lens fitting set, demonstrating that 24 lenses of various designs could fit 87% of all patients. This is Dr. Reuben Greenspoon in 1939 being filmed for a short subject popular science film called The Eyes Have It, where he discussed the use of scleral shells to create prosthetic theatrical effects to create eye color changes, blindness, or man to animal transformations. His office was in the Bank of America building in Beverly Hills and the office next door was the William Morris Agency. Actors routinely were referred for theatrical effects with scleral shells. This is an actor, Henry Hall in the movie Miracles for Sale, a 1939 murder mystery where the killer was unveiled in the last scene as a detective shoots him removes his blue contact lenses and displays his natural brown eyes. 
World War II ended trade with Germany during that period and experimentation with a new material called plexiglass or polymethylmethacrylate, PMMA, enabled lenses to be even thinner, lighter, more reproducible, less reactive to temperature with extremely predictable optics. Ruben Greenspoon passed his molding techniques on to his son, Morton, who I had the pleasure to work with for over 35 years. Dr. Mort passed those techniques on to me, and here are three examples of our work. The special effects theatrical shells in the slide are number one, Lost Boys, uh, lenses worn by Kiefer Sutherland, Alex Winter, and all the other vampires. 1992, Bram Stoker's Dracula. This lens was worn by Dracula's Brides, the three Dracula's Brides, and this film won an Academy Award for makeup. And 1994, Wolf, Jack Nicholson, James Spader, and Michelle Pfeiffer wore these lenses. And they illustrate the little fenestration holes that help the exchange of oxygen and the exchange of fluid. Sadly, overwear skull shells at that time induced Sattler's veil, a chromatic aura visualized from corneal swelling. The indications for scleral shells in practice today are keratoconus, pellucid marginal degeneration, irregular astigmatism, post keratoplasty, RK, PRK, LASIK, ocular surface disease, Stevens Johnson syndrome, dry eye disease, GVHD, and ocular pemphigoid. Some knowledge nuggets for everybody in attendance. It takes about 50 cases to master techniques. No one bats 100%. Some corneas can't handle a decreased oxygen demand. Some patients don't have the dexterity or mental awareness to insert and remove large diameter lenses. The staff is quite important and needs to be extremely well trained for the patient's instruction. Staff often spends much more time with the patient than the fitter. Develop a cohesive strategy based on small size, 14.9 to 15.2, medium size, 16.0 to 17.0, and large, 18 to 19 and above. Use your in-house lab consultants for options, not on the menu. For example, example, on the 16 to 17 Zen lens design, you can do micro vaults to engineer around conglecula or tube shunts. And then the 18-19 Boston sight lens, they insert channels specifically in a custom design to vault over similar issues. Lastly, stay positive. This is a slide of a unique and helpful device called the Sea Green. And there's a green LED light in the, in the base and you put the inserter into the base. You put the lens on top of the inserter and fill it with saline. And the patient looks for the light and lowers their head down onto the lens rather than trying to hold the lens in their hand and slide it up to their eye. So as we look at this uh, graphic, the objective is to achieve a light touch scleral relationship that is quadrant specific on the peripheral haptic portion while vaulting over all aspects of the cornea in the optic section of the lens. And essentially what we're trying to do is minimize the central clearance to 150 microns at the steepest point, trying not to exceed 250 microns at the flattest point. The lens cannot move. The lens cannot create suction, making it difficult to remove. There cannot be any bubbles under the lens. So to finish up with Dr. Nade's case, uh, this patient had a very aggressive keratoconic situation that we had to maximize her potential for treatment. If we see an eye that a patient that has 2050 on the right eye and count finger in the left eye, historically, I think we would attack the left eye and look at a corneal transplant and then spend about a year trying to rehabilitate that eye before we address the right. So in this case, because of the aggressiveness of her keratoconus, we decided to go the other way. So this really illustrates the coordination of planned surgery and contact lens fitting to provide maximal monocular vision pre and post operatively with a goal of best corrected binocular vision. In this case, cross-linking of the better eye to slow, show slow progression while maximizing vision in the count finger eye to provide functional vision during the visual rehabilitation post-op period. Uh, as Dr. 
Nays mentioned, the left eye is uh, out of range for cross-linking because of her thickness or lack of thickness of her cornea. The process involved three sets of lenses over a two month period to stabilize the fit. We used a Zen lens toric peripheral curve design and a Boston XO material uh, in a prolate shape. Uh, those are the parameters of the lens. You can see essentially that the right lens obviously has got a flatter base curve, less minus power, less sag, and the toric peripheral curves were flat in the horizontal meridian and steep in the vertical meridian. Uh, and the LCD is what drops the lens at the limbus to make it closer um, in, a, in a position. The left eye, much deeper, much more minus, and it required unique toric peripheral curves in four meridians to get the lens to not have any seepage underneath it. Happily, the corrected acuity was 2025 in both eyes. Our last exam with this patient was 8620. Uh, and, the, and the best part of this is that in this period of time, she's been able to finish school, got married and had a child. She's wearing lenses 12 hours a day. It's been quite a year for her. Uh, this is my picture of the uh, topography with the Oculus uh, instrument on her right eye. And the difference in the colors versus Dr. Nate's slides are gonna be a relative versus an absolute scale. But essentially we use this A so we can you know, see the the shape of the eye, but also to use this as a teaching tool to the patients to show them what keratoconus is about. This is actually her better eye. And um, the instrument has a 3D demonstration slide so we can actually show to the patient um, what a cone looks like and also explain to her what the prolate shape and the design and the purposes are to make the scleral shell vault over that cornea and, and uh, have a nice apposition against the sclera. So thank you for your time on that. Thanks, Rick. I just want to bring it back um, one last time to just sum up with the case. Uh, as Rick mentioned, her entire life changed um, and she's actually you know, doing great now. Um, so I just wanted to show everybody um, some really heartwarming slides. Uh, so Valerie um, was a, um, a guest, I guess we can call her the guest of honor at our uh, foundation gala dinner. Um, here she is with Dr. Maskett and Drs. Maskett and Silver. She got up and she shared her story in front of everybody, um, a room of you know, over 200 people. Um, and she was amazing. And she even got to, to meet one of her favorites, Jack Black, um, who was really inspired by her. So I, I just thought that would be a nice way to end the case. Um, she's doing fantastic. And uh, we were so privileged to be a part of her care. Well, thank you, Steve. And, and thank you, Rick. Um, Steve is also going to present our next case that he co-managed with Dr. Dan Crevoy. Uh, Dr. Crevoy is a uh, glaucoma specialist par excellence was also a foundation board member. Uh, Dan trained with some of the giants uh, in glaucoma in New York, and then brought his expertise here to LA and has been incredibly helpful in managing the really difficult cases. Um, so uh, please uh, do share this next case with us, Dan. Thanks, I'm gonna start off um, just giving an introduction to this patient. This is a very, uh, this is a very complex case. Uh, and I'm sure we've all run into these cases where um, the patient has multifactorial um, issues that, that are resulting in vision loss. Um, and so let's just start with the case presentation. This is a 57 year old male who presented with blurred vision. He has a history of a retinal detachment, which was repaired by pars planar vitrectomy and scleral buccal in 2018. Um, he also had complicated cataract surgery and eventually ended up with an ACIOL. His presenting vision was count fingers at two feet. Um, in his right eye, his left eye thankfully had good useful vision, 20-30. Pressure in the right eye was 29 and in the left eye, 23. Uh, important to note that the pressure was minimally responsive to topical antihypertensive medications. So here's uh, slit lamp photos. You can see a uh, nice representation of the anterior chamber IOL and the view's hazy because of the corneal edema uh, that's occurred as a result 
of uh, the ACIOL. Um, and uh, showing you photos here of the conjunctiva, due to the sclerobuckle, the conjunctiva is very, very thin. Um, and as Dr. Creboy will, will uh, discuss, that makes it quite a challenge to proceed with any sort of filtering surgery. But in the infranasal quadrant, there seems to be some viable conjunctiva. Um, thankfully, this is a color fundus so you can see that his nerve is uh, relatively healthy appearing. So the best news is that this patient has a real shot at, at uh, regaining vision. Um, he does have some maculopathy. This is a mac an OCT macula of the right eye showing some loss of the, the foveal architecture and some overall thinning. Uh, and so how do we address a, plant, a patient like this? Well, you have to start with what's the most pressing issue. Clearly his intraocular pressure uh, not being responsive to topical medications is, is the glaring issue here. And so um, with this patient, we would prefer to control the pressure first with a, a, a glaucoma drainage device. And then we can, we can fix the cornea and the IOL um, afterward, but we wanna make sure we have good control of the pressure. So I will turn it over there, over to Dr. Crevoy and he'll share his expertise on how he approached this patient's surgery. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, let me share the screen. Yep, thank you, Steve, Sam, and all the outstanding panelists and all of you for joining us today. Um, I just wanna add uh, the fact that there was a gap of almost three years between the incident that caused this gentleman to lose his vision and until he's been able to receive the care that he needs to visually rehabilitate it through the foundation. And uh, needless to say, this has caused a significant strain on his personal life. Financially, he lost his job, had a hard time finding a job, his significant consequences on his family as well. Um, and this case, uh, from the clinical standpoint, presents many challenges. Uh, before I get into the management of this patient, I um, want to point out some important facts about the relationship between the glaucoma and the corneal endothelium. Um, first, we know that the endothelial cell density is lower in glaucoma patients. There is an inverse relationship between the intraocular pressure and endothelial cell density. We know that because there is no difference in the endothelial cell density between normal patients and patients with normal tension glaucoma. Yet the opposite is true in patients that have had an acute attack of anger closure glaucoma who have significantly decreased endothelial cell density. And this reminds me of another patient that the foundation was able to make a significant difference in, a patient that came to me after an acute attack of glaucoma that I successfully management, managed through lens surgery and restored the pupil through a surclash, but this patient could not be visually rehabilitated for years because of being underinsured until the foundation was able to, to help us. Um, with the regards to some unintended consequences of glaucoma surgery is the progressive loss of corneal endothelial cells. Tube shunts in particular have a greater reported endothelial cell loss when compared to a trabeculectomy. In a trabeculectomy, you have a smaller decline of endothelial cell density uh, of 3.2% over 12 months compared to uh, 8 to 29% after an amid valve. And in fact, in this study, the most frequent complica complication of an amid glaucoma valve was the corneal decompensation when occurred, which occurred in 27% of the patients in a two-year follow. Just to give you some background with regards to traditional glaucoma implants, uh, the implants are typically placed on the supratemporal quadrant where there is plenty of room for the implant away from the oblique muscles. Here you see the superior oblique and there's plenty of eyelid and conjunctiva to cover the hardware. And the implant is typically placed on the anterior chamber, um, which in this case, because of the challenges that Steve just mentioned, um, couldn't be done. From the surgical standpoint, I'll ask Steve to, um, to share the video so that I can explain the, uh, 
process. Um, as Steve mentioned, one of the biggest challenges was that this patient had no conjunctiva. The conjunctiva was inserted at the level of the recti muscles, if you can see here. So I will show you with my forceps that there's really no conjunctiva to work with. This is just epithelialized sclera. So there's no way to put a supratemporal implant uh, and have it covered adequately. So inspecting the inferior nasal quadrant, which is our second choice because it's a tighter space, closer proximity to the muscles and more likelihood of exposure, decided it was more suitable. So we incised the conjunctiva far from the inferonasal quadrant, just to allow for us to be able to perform conjunctivoplasty should we not have enough uh, conjunctiva to appropriately cover the hardware and reapproximate it at the limbus. So you have to perform a very careful blunt dissection to try to bring up the conjunctiva as close as you can to the limbus and uh, you encounter the challenges along the way, you'll see how the insertion of the conjunctiva is variable and it goes fairly posterior. And you have to make a fairly large uh, infranasal peritomy, again, just to give yourself enough conjunctiva to work with. Dissect this clara into the, um, this carding into the infranasal quadrant to create space for the implant to go. Um, the, you will find the scleral buckle right there at the tip of the Westcott scissors. Um, among significant scarring, and then attempting to isolate the inferior and medial recti muscles to ensure that there's enough space for the implant. Uh, we are actually using the smallest implant, it's a Barbell 250 pediatric size. We, that is a non-valved implant, so we're ligating the tube to make sure there's no hypotony after surgery. I'm very fine that it's completely ligated, but that will cause pressure spikes after. So we create these fenestrations or punctures anterior to the ligature to ensure that there is a trickle of aqueous uh, until the implant is fully functional. As you can see, we managed to put the implant, this is in uh, underneath the medial rectus muscle and then subsequently underneath the inferior rectus. And uh, it's important to then bring the uh, implant to a proper position, fixated to the sclera uh, with non-absorbable sutures. Um, and uh, once the implant is in good location and stable and well fixated, uh, we measure the tube to have adequate length. We will be inserting the pars plana and this time we cut it with a posterior bevel to make sure that iris or IOL does not block the tube. Um, as far posterior as we can in the, in the pars plana because we anticipate there will be a scleral fixated um, intraocular lens, we will enter four millimeters from the limbus and you can see with the 23 gauge needle, the needle through the pupil, I am moving it. There's patient was already vitrectomized. So we're not, there's no vitres. I'm not uh, just to show you the location of the needle. And uh, we then uh, insert the tube through that incision. It is, uh, you feed it through the incision and it is important to make sure since I'm not gonna be able to see this tube at the slit lamp that we are in the correct location. Um, I will show you through the pupil inferiorly, you can see the tip of the tube showing up around now. I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer. Uh, yeah, thank you, Steve. That's the tip of the tube. So we know we're not supracoroidal or any other um, space which would be detrimental. And then if we are in the right location, you should see aqueous humor percolate through the incisions that we made, the penetrations we made on the tube and you see the droplet Forming. I'm lifting the tube from the sclera there to show you that this will provide pressure control initially until the ligature um, at the base of the tube dissolves and the flow goes to the plate. To make sure the tube doesn't slip out of the eye because of tension or eye movement, it is uh, secured with a non-absorbable nylon suture. And then that's a piece of uh, hardware under the lower eyelid. So it's going to be covered with a partial thickness corneal graft, which cosmetically is more acceptable than a white scleral patch uh, to adequately cover all the hardware. And uh, the conjunctiva is then reapproximated at the limbus um, to ensure a complete closure. Um, this patient having adequate control of his glaucoma will be able to then undergo the um, IOL exchange with uh, posterior scleral fixation. So 
We're working on this patient as we speak and hope to report to you on his progress. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. There was, uh, again, that was great. Thank you so much. There was one question that came up from one of the attendees, um, which was um, when, when the uh, anterior chamber IOL is removed, what are the options for fixating uh, a lens? And so that's a, a big topic for discussion, but essentially um, because there's no sulcus, um, we, we have to sclerofixate the lens in this case. And so nowadays what we're doing is using Gore-Tex suture to sclerofixate, much as you saw in Dr. Naskett's video where he was sclerofixating the iris and lens complex. Um, or we can do a technique called uh, intrascleral haptic fixation, or uh, it's also known as the Yamani technique due to Shin Yamani, who was the creator of the technique, where we can actually uh, externalize haptics of a three-piece IOL through the sclera and then um, use a, a, a bit of cautery to uh, create a terminal bulb and then tuck those back in, and that can fixate the lens as well. So those are the two options when we uh, eventually operate on this patient. Dan, that was really just brilliant work. And I, again, I thank you so much for what you do for the foundation patients and for the, the quality of your work. It was just really remarkable. Uh, I now have the great honor to uh, introduce Nicole Fram. Uh, Nicole joined me in 2008. Nicole rapidly became, in my view, one of the very, very best young ophthalmologists uh, in this country. And she's, be, she's developed a reputation of really the, as the go-to source for management of very difficult, complex patients. And she's gonna share a couple of her foundation patients with us at this time. So Nicole. Okay, so is everybody seeing my screen right now? Yes. Good. So um, it's an honor to, to speak to you all today. And uh, the Masket Foundation is one of the things that makes me wanna get up in the morning and go to work. And so it's a pleasure to be able to share these cases. Um, these are my financial disclosures and there's no relevant financial disclosures that I have. So a 20 year old female with a corneal problem presented to uh, our office. She's a young woman from Afghanistan who's being sponsored in need of ocular care. And her family actually found us through Dr. Weintraub who recently retired. Um, she had severe photophobia, decreased vision for years and was unable to open her eyes to read or stay in school. Um, she uh, could not even get her vision checked accurately in the office. And what we found were there were these anterior stromal deposits in the cornea. Um, and the diagnosis of granular stromal dystrophy was made. And just to um, talk about what gran granular uh, corneal dystrophy is, it's characterized by recurrent corneal erosion. So these patients present usually in adolescence with um, you know, photophobia, un inability to open their eyes, and they're treated for recurrent corneal erosions in the beginning. There's a type one, which is granular only, and type two, which is granular lattice dystrophy, also known as avelino. It's autosomal dominant, and it's on the TGFBI gene. And so there's these hyaline deposits, and it can be amyloid if it's avelino also. So the treatment is really topical drops in the beginning. And sometimes you can do phototherapeutic keratectomy, which is PTK. Now that is great as long as you have enough cornea there um, and it's not as deep uh, in the cornea. Um, but you can also do corneal transplantation for these patients. And in fact, uh, the price group uh, reported on cases that actually were all granular dystrophy and who did well with what treatment. And it seemed like there was faster visual recovery with PTK or higher recurrence. And actually PKP, which is a full thickness or deep anterior lamellar were equivalent, but PKP seemed to do better. So that's a full thickness corneal transplant. So let's look at the imaging and diagnostics of this granular stromal dystrophy in this patient. And what we can see is her corneal topography is highly irregular. And we look at these placido imaging to kind of tell how is this patient being impacted. Next, we look at the anterior segment imaging. And here we wanna look at the depth of the granular deposits to see do we wanna do PTK or not. When it's greater than 150 microns of depth in a very thin cornea, you can actually take too much tissue and make them very hyperopic. And she was already hyperopic to begin with. So what we decided to do was we would try and attempt a DALC uh, which is a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty where you preserve the endothelium 
But if that didn't work, we were prepared to do a, um, a penetrating keratoplasty, which is the full thickness. So this careful measuring for centration is extremely important. Um, and we want to make sure we do all of our marks for our suturing. We have the privilege of having our tissue donated um, for, from uh, Cornea Gen, who's been very supportive of the foundation. And we go ahead and put that tissue, which is from someone who's passed away, who we refer to as angels. Um, and then we trephinate. And we trephinate with this little blade here. Um, then we are measuring um, the proper uh, diameter to then transplant the tissue. We set it aside while we prepare the recipient tissue. So we want to trephinate only to about 90%. And then we go ahead and we're going to try to make a little bit of air bubble. Uh, that did not work in this case. So we converted to a penetrating keratoplasty. So here we enter the anterior chamber and we're cutting with scissors and we're cutting away the diseased cornea. Um, you do need to move quickly at this point because we don't want any problems uh, with any uh, contents of the eye coming out. Uh, we go ahead and transplant here, and then we do our sutures in a symmetrical way uh, in order to decrease the amount of astigmatism. So here we're just uh, tying this up, um, and the patient uh, did quite well um, after surgery, and we're going to take you through her rehabilitation. Um, so next, who do I call? I call Rick Silver. So it takes a village to take care of these patients, and we text constantly and I texted him, you know, we have a patient that needs a scleral lens. Can you help? He texts back, I'm happy to do it. And I want to turn it over to Rick uh, right now to talk about how he fit this patient with a scleral lens. Thanks, Dr. Fram. Um, so this was a, an extremely rewarding case. Dr. Fram left me with a perfect palette and a platform to fit a lens on. Um, I saw the patient at six months post-op uh, and it was very, very challenging to evaluate her. She was 2400, pinholing 2100, and we assumed her vision was much more correctable, but testing was extremely difficult due to tremendous photophobia uh, and chronic tearing. It was really, really hard to keep her eyes open. So at the first visit, uh, I had no luck with a scleral shell. Her eyes were too sensitive, and I really couldn't get a lens in. So I changed. Uh, thought processes and I fit with a post-graft lenticular RGP design that had a 10.4 millimeter diameter. It's essentially a tri-curve lens where you control the base curve with an eight millimeter optic zone, a secondary curve, which is either flatter or steeper based on a prolate or oblate graft. And you can adjust a minimum of three to five diopters of difference between those two curves and a peripheral curve flatter or steeper in 50 or 100 micron steps. The training took two over one hour visits just to try to get her to get the lens in and out. Discomfort was excessive. Her maximum wearing time was one hour. And two weeks down the road, we weren't getting better. She was able to see 20, 30 with that RGP lens though. So we knew we had to proceed. At that time we changed gears. I refit her with a 16 millimeter prolate scleral design that took two more one-hour sessions to finally get the patient to be independent with the lens. Uh, as expected, the comfort was excellent. We refined the fit after the patient achieved a seven-hour wearing schedule uh, for a period of two weeks. The final parameters are interesting, and essentially uh, the numbers of a base curve of 710, a sag of 4.8, the RX is only minus a half, 16 millimeter design and a standard edge profile brought to light the fact that the refractive power was the correction needed was really close to Plano when we had the base curve aligned. So what Dr. Fram did was really give her the ability to see with almost very little or no correction in a rigid contact lens. And the edge design was standard so that in non-keratoconic eyes, uh, the, the scar was fairly spherical. So her issue was corneal. Uh, in the cone patients, obviously, we see very atypical scleras in addition. So uh, thank you for allowing me to be part of that case. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, so we were all on the journey together. And preoperatively, you can see that she, you know, 
couldn't barely open her eyes right before the surgery. Then one month post-operatively, she is starting to open her eyes more. She's, she's doing better. And then after both eyes have been treated, you can see she's a totally different person um, where she is in her office, able to open both eyes, do all her testing and record her vision. Um, so here's a testimonial. Hi, my name is Shibufa. I'm from Afghanistan. Um, I came here for eye surgery. I had coronary dystrophy and before the surgery, I'm not able to see the colors and I can even uh, see the box. So, uh, and I'm very sen sensitive with the sun. Um, after the surgery, I'm able to see uh, the colors and now I, I can able to draw painting and also I can play the piano. So thank you so much from Dr. Frame. So um, I just wanted to open it up if there were any questions uh, from the panel. If not, I was gonna move on to the next case. Nicole, before you, before you move on and, and Rick and Nicole, I, I just, I mean, the difference that you made in that young woman's life is just so remarkable. I also want to reach out uh, to the supporting family, uh, the Grimes family, Nancy and Matt, who have, I mean, brought her over, paid for her travel, and have housed her for over a year now, taking care of her. Um, and it's just, it's so uplifting to see what can be done uh, if people care and try. So the Grimes family, hats off to you as well. Absolutely. I mean, it's just an inspirational story to just makes you really uh, believe that there are people in the community that really want to help. Um, and it's just, um, it's exceptional that we're able to help this woman, um, a young woman. Um, so next, uh, we're going to take it to the next case, which is a 49 year old male with sudden vision loss. He was referred by a prominent attending in LA. He's a monocular patient had trauma years ago and a croidal rupture. Um, in his right eye, but still had some vision potential. And his left eye was NLP. Um, his best corrected vision in the past, as far as we could tell from the records, was about 2200. And now he pre presents hand motion and unable to function. He can't see his children, his family, he can't navigate. Um, he was seen at Harbor UCLA and was unable to get assistance in a timely fashion. So they were you know, six to eight weeks uh, in order to get to him. So I get this text saying, can you please, you know, the, can the Masket Foundation help this patient? And um, we were able to get him in uh, right away. Um, and what we saw in the ocular examination, and this is a slit lamp photo, uh, is that he had a white um, intumescent cataract. So intumescent it means that the, the capsule is swollen. And so this is under a lot of tension and the water going into the lens is probably why it, it accelerated so fast. He was hand motion, no light perception. His pressure was actually okay. He had a history of trauma. And so there was an iridodialysis superiorly, but it was small and covered by the eyelid. But when you go into these cases, you wanna make sure that the ligaments that are holding the lens in place are gonna work well. And so we send an immediate text to the referring doctor saying he's scheduled for the next, um, the next Monday, we're gonna get him on and we'll have retina on standby. So Daniel Sue from Retina Vitreous, which uh, was founded uh, by David Boyer, um, they have a foundation also. So they worked with the Masket Foundation to make sure there was a retina doctor there on standby in case we had to uh, use retina if the lens was unstable. We wanted this patient to have one surgery to rehabilitate his vision. And so we think about white and intumescent cataracts, there's the old school way, which is doing everything manually, which works very well and is very reproducible. And we're gonna show a new school way, which is using a femtosecond assisted laser technology to help us uh, do the hardest part of the surgery. So we look at uh, conventional surgical management. We wanna make a small capsorexis and spiral out because when you touch the capsule and it's under pressure, then the fluid needs to come out because you have to have an equilibration of the anterior chamber to make sure that the uh, capsorexis does not split out and cause an Argentinian flag sign. We use tripan blue, 
We use a cohesive OVD to flatten, and we use a parous plane of vitreous tap if there's not a lot of room to work in the anterior chamber, and IV mannitol to decompress the vitreous so that we can actually flatten this chamber. And this is Dr. Maskett uh, depicting a beautiful spiral out technique where we start small and spiral out so that we don't have risk of having um, the capsule uh, tear out to the equator. So my question was, can we cheat? So years ago, the femtosecond laser came on the scene and it really has become beneficial in patients that have a white cataract, as long as they're not under too much pressure and you can have a flat dock. So the docking of the laser has to be completely flat and it has to be a fast laser. So making the capsular excess in less than a second is critical. And having these microsurgical instruments will help you to complete it because sometimes you get three quarters of it, but it's not all the way completed with the femtosecond laser. So in this case, we were able to use the latest and best technology for this patient, irrespective of his financial background. And we use the femtosecond laser, we stain the capsule, and here you can see we have a complete capsular excess, but we're going very slowly pulling towards the center uh, so that we can maintain these forces in case there's an area that's not complete. So you need to treat it as if it's not complete 360 degrees, um, but the laser was helped us do the hardest part of the surgery. So now we go ahead and just do our phaco emulsification. And often these are kind of chalky and they crack very easily. They don't have a lot of cortical uh, material that's uh, remnant. We don't wanna rotate because we know that the zonule has been affected uh, by the trauma. So we're just kind of picking up the pieces and bringing them centrally. Um, and this case ends up going very well and it ends up being very routine. So now we're, the lens is so soft that we're using irrigation uh, and aspiration to kind of get the final pieces out. Um, and we clean everything up, uh, clean our lens, uh, anterior lens epithelial cells and put the intraocular lens into the capsular bag. And we, don't, uh, we didn't repair the superior irritable dialysis because the lid was covering it. We didn't wanna complicate the surgery uh, anymore. So this is a, you know, why partnering with the community to fill the gap in care is so amazing. You know, we were finished with the surgery and the whole family uh, comes to the bedside. And it was just such an impactful moment uh, for the family. And after we immediately text the doctor that everything went well, he ended up uh, 2150, which is a, a, a big improvement for him. And one of the best stories that he told me was how prior to the surgery, his four-year-old son was kind of um, navigating him around the house. And then after the surgery, his son was so excited that his dad uh, could be independent. So I wanted to thank you all uh, for allowing me to share this case and open it up for some questions. Okay. So I noticed that we do have some questions uh, from the attendees and some are addressed. Uh, I'll take the, the first one. Uh, Nicole, uh, would you be kind enough at the end, though, to uh, explain to uh, some of the participants how they can refer patients into the foundation process? So one question is that what makes the human optics iris that I demonstrated safer uh, than the other ones, which I said is a no-no? It's actually not so much the device as to where it goes. As I mentioned, um, the human optics artificial iris is intended to only go into eyes that are either having cataract surgery or have had cataract surgery. They can be fixated to the eye wall or in the capsule bag, but never in front of an existing iris in the anterior chamber angle. Um, the new iris and other devices, um, those are specifically designed to go in the chamber angle in front of the normal existing iris. And that's where the problem comes in because they cause significant irritation. They have almost these barb-like attachments into the, uh, into the angle and that induces inflammation, bleeding, and ultimately iris atrophy, cataract glaucoma. So again, it's, it's uh, the, the intention of the human optics iris is that it goes, never goes in the chamber angle. Um, Let's see the next question. Uh, Nicole, this seems to be to you about granular dystrophy. Do you want to handle that? 
Yeah. So, you know, granular dystrophy is autosomal dominant. So you want to investigate uh, the family history. The question is, you know, for most of these cases, you want to start with PTK. Um, as long as their corneal thickness is, is large enough and the granules don't, the, the granules don't go too far into the subepithelium. Um, you know, but this patient was already hyperopic. This patient already had a 400 micron cornea and it was decided that corneal transplantation was uh, the proper thing. It was fascinating reading this, um, you know, review from Price, Frank Price and his group showing that patients, although they got better faster, it was PKP that did the best in this patient population. So um, the, the deposits in the beginning are not going to be uh, that troublesome, and then they get worse as the patient progresses. It's fine to start with PTK, uh, uh, but ultimately the patient may need a deep anterior lamellar or a penetrating keratoplasty. The benefit to a deep anterior lamellar is that they have their same endothelium that they that's innate to their body, so they can't reject the tissue as much. Um, penetrating keratoplasty is, is a full thickness. Uh, I think we have time probably for just one more question. And um, uh, Nicole, why don't you take the last question and um, then we'll uh, end up. So Since our time is running about, short. Yeah, femtosecond laser. Um, you know, there's, there's some discrepancies in the community and in the literature about whether or not white cataracts um, should be um, done manually or with a femtosecond laser. And I think the most important thing is that the lens has to be relatively normal in size. So, it, you know, a normal size is about, you know, 4.5 millimeters. Um, if the lens thickness is six millimeters and the anterior chamber depth is two millimeters, um, you're gonna have some trouble. You need to decompress and any femtosecond laser could cut and then release milk and then it blocks the whole thing and you could end up with an Argentinian flag sign. The other thing is if there's fibrosis of the capsule, it won't cut, the femtosecond laser won't cut through that area of fibrosis. So those are the cases that you wanna do manually. But if it's a white cataract and you can check uh, with your OCT imaging right before you do the femtosecond laser, that the thickness is not too big and it's not under too much pressure, you can feel very comfortable with the technique that was shown of using a femtosecond laser. Uh, as our time is running short, uh, I wanna really thank our panelists very much for their expertise and, and ask Nicole to tell people how they can refer into the foundation and in fact, how they can donate to the foundation. Great, so um, you know how to refer a patient, you can go to the Masket Foundation website and you click on contact us um, and you can fill out uh, the form there um, online. Many people have our phone number to advanced vision care or even our cell phones and you can always reach out to us and we will uh, make things happen and accommodate the patient as soon as possible. So there's two ways that you can go about doing that. Um, donations matter. So, you know, each case is supported fully by the Masket Foundation, although industry does help us with certain technology to give people the state of the art care. So clicking on donate on the Masket Foundation website um, is critical in allowing us to continue to care for these patients. Yeah, one other comment is that uh, specialty surgery center in Beverly Hills, where we do the surgery um, also uh, gives us special uh, cash prices for our patients, helping us ma maintain good care for our patients with absolutely top of the line materials. Nicole, back to you. Great, so I'm gonna stop my share, but you know, it's really through the collaboration of industry, the community doctors that are willing to donate their time um, that has helped us really uh, do the kind of work uh, that we want to do to fill that gap. We're not going to change the healthcare system, but we're going to make sure that people aren't walking around Los Angeles going blind. Yes, the foundation says everyone has the right to good sight. Um, please do uh, fill out the survey once it, once, uh, it reaches you, and uh, then we will in turn uh, send you your certificates for continuing education or continuing med medical education credits. Uh, once again, I thank the panelists for their expertise and particularly for helping uh, these foundation patients. And I thank you for your attending. And I do hope that was meaningful for you. Uh, all have a very, very pleasant day. Bye-bye now.